Good evening, Professor Lieben, Dr. Rutro Chaudhary, Scott Persetton Wood, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome on this evening, which I'm sure will heat up much further as we delve into the topic. And we're delighted, we're truly delighted to see such a great turnout, so thank you for coming. Anantha Aspen Center, which was formerly Aspen India, is delighted and truly honored to work with the British Deputy High Commission on this event this evening. Anatol and Luthro, we very much appreciate you making Kolkata one of your stops because uh, there's always complaints that Kolkata is never one of the spots for somebody exciting coming in. So thank you for uh, making that happen. And I know Ruthro was traveling a little bit, um, you know, having interactions on his newly published book, which is uh, Forged in Crisis, India and the United States since 1947. Uh, but this evening, uh, getting back to the discussion uh, at hand, this evening focuses on withdrawal and its implications. Um, the future of Afghanistan, a very topical issue indeed. Uncertainties permeate the security, political, economic uh, transitions in Afghanistan as uh, with the withdrawal of the American and international SAF uh, approaches uh, this year. So this evening, I'm sure this discussion will raise many issues, many questions, challenges, uh, which our eminent panel our eminent speakers from King's College will address. Um, so do save some time and you know ask them some interesting questions as well. Scott first first and good uh, will be chairing this the session this evening. A career diplomat, uh, Scott uh, assumed charge as the British Deputy High Commissioner, Eastern India, last year in October, and uh, prior to being posted in Kolkata. Uh, he had served in the British Embassy, uh, based in Washington, D.C., where he, he was first the head of strategic uh, threats and then as the head as of the political section, where he was also responsible for the coverage of the 2012 presidential elections. Prior to Washington, he spent a couple of years at the Foreign Office in London as private secretary to the Minister of State for the Middle East and South Asia, during which time he traveled to over 50 countries, including India. So, as you see, uh, Scott, with his master's in political, in politics, philosophy, and economics from Oxford, and his vast knowledge of ground realities due to his extensive travel, I'm sure you'll agree with me, he make the most interesting moderator this evening. So with that, over to you, Scott. to say a few words before we get started. On, on behalf of my team at the British Deputy High Commission here in Kolkata and our partners, uh, our excellent partners for this event in the Aspen uh, Centre, I'm really delighted to welcome you here this evening and to see so many people here uh, this evening for this very important discussion. I'm delighted too that our two uh, expert speakers, Professor Anatol Lehman and Dr. Richard uh, Chowdhury, from King's College London can be here with us today. I'll introduce them in a bit more detail shortly. But it's great that they can be here with us in Kolkata. As you all know, this city has, of course, long been an intellectual powerhouse. It's a place where weighty issues are debated with insight and vigor. And although Kolkata may be 1,400 miles from Kabul, I know that the subject of intervention in Afghanistan has been debated as vigorously and as fiercely here in recent years as it was in the Calcutta of the 19th century. So I'm confident that when we've heard from our speakers, the audience here today will have some excellent questions for our speakers and we can have a, a genuinely um, frank and open conversation. Before we start talking about Afghanistan, I just want to take a few minutes to say a word or two about King's College London, where our speakers are from, and about British universities more generally. Now, King's College London, as I'm sure you all know, in fact, I know that there are some people here uh, who have connections to King's College London, is one of the world's leading research and teaching universities, based in the very heart of London. It's also home to the King's India Institute, which was created in 2012 to be a centre for global engagement with contemporary India, 
And that's a mission that my organisation, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, has strongly supported. And in fact, the Institute delivers some really fantastic, high quality training for diplomats like me working in this region, which in fact is how I first met uh, Rudolf Anton. Now, King's is one of many world class universities in the UK. In fact, it's one of six UK universities which are in the world top 20. Um, we in the UK are rightly, I think, very proud of our universities and we are absolutely determined to ensure that more and more international students, and in particular more and more people from India, choose UK universities uh, for their studies. Um, now, we have something called the Chevening Scholarship Programme, which is a very important part of that. Chevening is designed uh, to help us build a strong network of friends of the UK around the world, people who will be influential in their fields and will rise to uh, important positions. Most importantly, people who will uh, remember their time in the UK fondly and will remain friends of ours wherever they end up. Chevening has been around for about 30 years and it's fostered many valuable connections for us across the globe, um, certainly across India, and I'm glad to say uh, in this region of India as well. I know that there are a number of Chevening scholars here with us this evening. It's very good to see you all. Now, the Indian element of the Chevening programme is in fact the largest element of the Chevening programme. Now, in recognition of the deeper, wider, stronger relationship that the United Kingdom would like to have with India, we're increasing the funding of the Chevening programme further still and increasing the number of scholarships available. And in total, up to 700 scholarships are offered to Indians by UK institutions each year, including 40 Chevening scholarships sponsored directly by the UK Foreign Office. And that figure is going to increase to 77 in the year 2014-15. So through this scholarship programme, hundreds more of India's brightest and best students will get the opportunity to study in the UK. And I'm pleased to say that we fund more scholarships for students from India than we do for any other country in the world. So this is the shameless plug. If you know of anyone who is looking um, to study overseas, please do recommend Britain's great universities to them. Tell them about the achievement programme, point them in our direction. We would be absolutely delighted to help them apply. So now I've uh, finished my shameless plug. I've earned my wages for this evening. Let's talk about uh, the wages subject of Afghanistan, which is why you're all here this evening, of course. As we've heard, this year, 2014, is a critical point in Afghanistan's economic, political and security transition as US and ISAF forces withdraw during the course of this year. And of course for us in the United Kingdom it's a very important uh, point in that journey as well. Now, as with our other international partners, this doesn't mean that the UK is leaving Afghanistan altogether. Our combat troops are leaving. They will almost all go by the end of, of this year. But Afghanistan is far too important and still too fragile for us or anyone else in the international community to abandon altogether. Now, Afghanistan has never been an easy place for outsiders, wherever they come from. The Persians knew that, the Russians discovered that, and the British, of course, know that too from our own history. So the first question you might ask, indeed it's a question that people in the UK have legitimately asked on a regular basis, is why is Britain engaged at all in Afghanistan? Why have we been? The answer for us is quite simple. Afghanistan matters far too much for us to ignore it. It matters first and foremost to our security. We went into Afghanistan after 9-11 to stop the country from being a safe haven for international terrorists. And if Afghanistan were ever to become such a haven again, it would threaten not just us, not just Afghanistan's neighbors, but the world. So Afghanistan matters strategically because an unstable Afghanistan would threaten this whole region. Um, including, of course, India. And it matters for us on a deeply personal and political level because over the last decade or so, the UK has spent an extraordinary amount of blood and treasure in Afghanistan. Our operations there have cost us uh, billions of pounds, and since those operations started, over 400 of our brave servicemen and women have been killed in Afghanistan. We are determined to ensure that that heavy price paid uh, has an outcome worthy of their sacrifice. So that's why Afghanistan's future matters greatly uh, to us. Um, to us, to Afghanistan's neighbours, in fact to the whole world. So this is a very important topic. This is why we wanted to have this conversation here today. And I'm absolutely delighted that we have two such eminent speakers to lead us in that conversation. Um, Professor Michael Lehman is Chair of International Relations in the War Studies Department of King's College London and a Senior Fellow of the New American Foundation in Washington, D.C. 
His recent book, Pakistan, A Hard Country, which was published by Penguin Books in 2011, was selected by the Daily Telegraph as one of the 2011 books of the year. And his, I'm told, available in all good bookshops. Um, <laughs> Professor Lee spent most of his career as a British journalist in South Asia and the former Soviet Union and is the author of several books on the latter region. I'm sure we can have a whole other conversation um, about that, perhaps another time. There's a BA in History and a PhD in Political Science uh, from the University of Cambridge. And from 2000 to 2005, he was a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. In 2005, he became a senior research fellow of the New America Foundation, as I say, a position he continues to hold. He writes a regular monthly column for the Financial Times and is published frequently in other newspapers and journals. And Dr. on my right, Dr. Ruta Chowdhury, uh, is senior lecturer at the War Studies Department and the India Institute of King's College London. Um, Dr. Chowdhury joined the department in September 2009, having previously taught at the UK Joint Services and Command and Staff College. In September of 2012, his position as lecturer was divided between War Studies and the India Institute. Kings. Currently, he's the program director for the MA South Asia and Global Security course. He completed his BA at St. Stephen's College, Delhi University, his MA at Exeter University, and a PhD in the Department of War Studies at Kings. Together with his colleagues in the department, he has served as a consultant to British commanders in Afghanistan. He's also worked closely with my uh, organization, the Foreign <coughs> Commonwealth Office, as program director for confidential stakeholder conferences and workshops focusing on the economic and political future of Afghanistan, India-Pakistan relations, and the thorny issue of reconciliation with the Taliban. And as you've heard, he also has a book out, um, Forged in Crisis, India and the United States in 1947, similarly available in the book. <laughs> um, so now that we've done all the introductions, I think it's time to get started. I think Anatole, you're going to kick off. We'll then hear from Rudra and we'll go from there. And please, we want this to be as interactive a session as possible. So get your questions ready and uh, we'll be delighted to take them. Thank you so much. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. And it, 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 is it right if I stay sitting or would you prefer me to? Can everyone? Yeah. Okay, if I, if I stay here. It's probably a bit more informal. Um, it, it's very nice to be back here. Thank you all for coming, especially um, during the elections. And I also sort of want to say thank you so much to the British Deputy High Commission uh, for inviting me, and of course to the Aspen, um, and uh, to Professor Saranjan Das and Calcutta University uh, for their cooperation with King's College, my uh, Rudy's University. And we, we hope through this to have even closer intellectual links with Calcutta in the future. Uh, I thought I'd talk first about the future of Afghanistan in the context of the present, uh, as you have said, sir, drawdown, not complete withdrawal from Afghanistan. Because people talk about complete withdrawal, as I should say, that is uh, not in fact going to happen. Uh, and then um, talk a bit about uh, the impact on Pakistan, Pakistani <coughs> attitudes and policies towards this. I should say that I was in Afghanistan, in Kabul and Helmand in the autumn, and I was actually in Pakistan last month and talked to several <coughs> members of the government in Islamabad, and uh, Owen Bennett Jones of the BBC and I, you may perhaps some of you have seen his reports on the BBC, were taken on a, an army trip to South Afghanistan to see how the campaign against the Pakistani Taliban is going. Now, to start with the Afghan. Uh, elections. I think I probably wouldn't um, uh, make a, a prediction about the results. Uh, a few days ago, here, after you know, Rudy and I are not here for very long on this occasion, but um, with regard to the Indian elections, the figure of 30 seats had come up for, oh, I can't remember, perhaps the sixth or seventh time in conversation. And I, um, I said that perhaps we might all wait and see. Well, the journalist I was talking to, as you can imagine, looked at me not just as if I was mad, but as if I was some kind of deranged beast. And I have to say, as a former journalist myself, I was indeed deeply ashamed of myself for saying that. But I'm afraid that is what I'm going to say about the Afghan elections. We shall just have to wait and see. I don't think there's a great deal of point in predicting, you know, at this stage, who's going to win. So I'll stick to what can be predicted, um, which is that assuming, which I think is probably a reasonable assumption now, that things could still go badly wrong, that there is a legitimate and stable result. Uh, of course, both of the remaining candidates have promised to sign uh, the security agreement with the United States, which will enable a continuation 
of a limited number of US troops, around 12,000 probably, uh, US bases, uh, some air forces and special forces. So yes, the United States is not withdrawing completely. It uh, will have a very considerable stake there uh, until, well, the treaty will expire in 2024, but certainly for a, uh, a number of years to come. Uh, at present, unless something has, has changed, I must confess I haven't checked in, uh, in recent weeks, um, the idea is that this will not involve even combat air cover, a combat role for the US Air Force in Afghanistan. Uh, I have to say that um, this is something that makes, as you can imagine, the Afghan armed forces deeply nervous. Uh, it makes Western commanders in Afghanistan very nervous, and in fact, from my conversations, I don't think that this is sustainable, uh, because it would be extremely difficult for the United States you know, to keep bases and forces in Afghanistan, and then just to sit by doing nothing as um, you know, as Afghan, Afghan National Army positions were overrun. Uh, this is something which is particularly vivid for me because I was a journalist for the London Times uh, with the Mujahideen, not the Taliban. I sometimes confuse these two words. <laughs> I've given certain uncomfortable similarities between some of them. Uh, the Mujahideen, when they were our allies uh, in the late 1980s, and as such, I was present at the Battle of Jalalabad, uh, where, of course, uh, we on the Western side all predicted that the Najibullah regime would collapse immediately that the Soviets withdrew. Of course, it didn't happen. Uh, and at the Battle of Jalalabad, they gave the Mujahideen a very bloody nose indeed. But of course, they did so with the help of air cover and, uh, and artillery. The importance of air cover also lies, of course, in um, not just the maintenance of protection for outlying positions, but plays a critical part in Afghan National Army morale. Um, there are already concerns that the end of medevac by air could have a serious effect on the morale of the troops for reasons one can well understand. Um, if they felt to you know, cut off from air support as well, I don't think that that would be a good signal. And um, While undoubtedly they will in any case be, be pulling back from certain exposed positions, it's very important that that should not become a kind of cascade, a rout. So, but I, I don't think that will happen. I think that the, um, the, the, the US will continue a measure of cover. Now, <clears throat> that's one side of things. Um, but even more important, and also critically, of course, uh, revealed by the Soviet and Afghan experience, after the Soviet withdrawal, uh, is a continuation of international, which means chiefly um, Western aid, but of course India is also contributing uh, quite, a, quite a large amount by now. Uh, because, uh, as I said, the, um, well, they weren't really communist, but whatever you want to call it, the, the, the Afghan state that the Soviets left behind in, in 1989 uh, survived really very well indeed, beat off repeated attacks. But the, the reason it collapsed in the end was it, it outlived the Soviet Union itself. The Soviet Union collapsed, of course, in December 91. The Najibullah regime didn't collapse until March of 92. But the reason it collapsed, of course, was that Soviet subsidies, Soviet money, guns, fuel, uh, were cut off with the, with the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, at which point, naturally, the armed forces disintegrated and then the state fell to pieces with as we all know, catastrophic results for Afghanistan and later for the region and, of course, the United States as well. Well, in some respects, even more worrying than the continued campaign by the Taliban and their allies in Afghanistan, or rather perhaps another aspect of the same problem, uh, is the fact that the Afghan state uh, is dependent for around 90% of its entire budget on external aid, 90%. Uh, and when it comes to uh, the security budget, the Afghan National Army and police, in effect, that's 100% virtually um, from, of course, overwhelmingly the United States. And I think one can't emphasize strongly enough how important it is that that must continue. Um, and from that point of view, uh, you know, there are, of course, some worrying tendencies um, you know, in, in terms of attitudes in the United States Congress. 
uh, and still more in European parliaments when it comes, of course, the Europeans aren't funding the security forces mostly, but uh, in terms of funding the Afghan state, one can see a very, very considerable degree of war weariness, um, uh, a desire really to pull out completely. And now, uh, of course, the, um, the US armed forces, uh, which have invested so much in terms of lives lost and prestige, uh, will be, I think, determined to, to go on um, helping the Afghan National Army. Uh, but of course, in the end, the funding does depend on Congress. From that point of view, the year 2016 will be important because that is when several of the major donors uh, will be looking again at the levels of their aid to Afghanistan. Um, and uh, that is why, of course, it is also so important um, that these Afghan elections, the second round as well as the first, should produce uh, a result which is legitimate, not just in the eyes of Afghans, but also of international donors. Uh, because, unfortunately, for a very long time to come, uh, well, in effect, the West created the present Afghan state. Uh, we've created a state which is our baby, um, and it will need us to go on nourishing it for a very long time to come. Uh, when it comes to the, to the Taliban, um, I think there's no doubt uh, that um, next year there, there will be a major Taliban offensive. Um, they have not, of course, tried on a large scale to disrupt the elections. Uh, and one, of course, uh, s since um, interviews with the, the Taliban are a little difficult, um, I, I would like to do what I'm afraid quite a number of Pakistani experts do, which is hint that Mullah Omar told me his whole strategy over a bottle of whiskey last week. But you probably wouldn't believe me, so I won't. Uh, we don't know. But it is striking that they have not tried to disrupt these elections. But then that's also been true to a great extent of previous elections. And I think the reason is that the Taliban are somewhat more politically sophisticated than one thinks. And over the years have gen generally tried to avoid what could be seen simply as indis completely indiscriminate attacks. In that they are very different. And the Pakistani Taliban, of course, slaughtered people completely indiscriminately in markets, you know, mosques, just like you know, Al Qaeda in Iraq, and so on. Um, and uh, so they have had a, you know, a hands, to some extent, hands off approach during the elections. But undoubtedly, uh, after Western combat troops on the ground withdraw, uh, I think there is bound to be a push, uh, of course. Um, by the Taliban as a whole, but certainly insisted upon by the military committee in Peshawar and by the hardline forces within the Taliban uh, to see if they can't crumple up the ANA um, and, uh, and win, if, if not of course conquer the whole country at one go, see if they can't make some very significant gains on the ground. And uh, that is also why uh, it is so important to this <coughs> air cover be there if necessary. Uh, because, of course, I'm sorry to say a difference between this time around and the post-Soviet experience is that, uh, partly because they had devoted much more attention to this, but also because the Soviets inherited a badly battered and decayed, but still basically intact old Afghan royal army and air force. Um, we, of course, didn't in 2001, and. Um, Unfortunately, for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me, we haven't done nearly enough to build that up. So the general analysis is that it will be 2017 and the earliest before Afghanistan has its own air force that is capable of giving air cover to its troops. That's a pretty serious gap, which I do believe the United States will have to continue to fill, or what he certainly should continue to fill. Um, now, I think that both as far as the Taliban itself and as far as, uh, to, to, to uh, some degree, Pakistani policy is concerned, uh, what happens first with um, the Taliban offensive next year, uh, and, and then, well, first with the results of these elections, then with the Taliban offensive next year, then with uh, the, the continuation of, or not of major Western aid, uh, will be of critical importance because I think in the end to change the positions of these forces or elements they will only be convinced ultimately by facts. 
If, uh, God forbid, Taliban offensive next year um, makes major advances, then obviously by definition that will strengthen those very considerable elements within the Afghan Taliban who do believe that victory is possible through military means. Um, and that you know the thing to do is just to attack and attack and attack. If, on the other hand, they suffer um, uh, a, some bloody reverses and do not gain uh, significant amounts of territory, or at least, you know, undoubtedly, they can take back a considerable number of villages, but nothing in you know, a seriously important centre, then it is at least possible um, that one will see a strengthening of some of the strands of opinion represented by figures linked uh, to the Taliban, I would say, kind of interlocutors uh, linked to the more, shall we say, pragmatic elements of the Taliban, uh, with whom uh, Rudra and I have met, um, together with other colleagues, in recent years. Um, and this strand of opinion in the Taliban does, well, first, does not actually believe that they can win militarily, in the sense of reconquering the 90% or 85% or so of the country that they ruled in the summer of 2001. And one of the reasons they don't believe that, and by the way, this is also true of um, mainstream Pakistani military analysis, uh, is that they think that there will be uh, not just forces in Afghanistan, um, the other nationalities, of course, the Hazara, the Tajik, uh, who will prevent this, but these forces in the end will get too much support, even if the United States withdraws completely, which it won't. Uh, but, of course, too much support from other countries, including India, to make this possible. Uh, then there are various other elements. Um, there is a, among the people we talk to, there is a real fear uh, that uh, if they continue the fight and are seen by much, even of Pashtun public opinion, uh, as, cont as being responsible for continuing an unnecessary civil war, that their support and recruitment would suffer badly. Uh, there is also a, a real fear among people who in their own funny way are actually Afghan nationalists, Pashtun Afghan nationalists, that a continuation of the war in this form uh, would lead to the de facto disintegration of Afghanistan. In other words, a, a situation without foreseeable end akin to what existed in the mid-1990s and which they regard themselves as having saved Afghanistan from, in other words, the disintegration of the country into effectively, you know, different ethnic warlords, but de facto. And there are a range of other concerns that they, that they have here. So one might hope that if the Taliban, you know, can suffer some severe reverses over the next couple of years, uh, that these elements within the Taliban would be strengthened, and that ultimately uh, one could hope either for a gradual fraying of the Taliban, you know, individual commanders, making the kind of individual truces with government forces, not necessarily by any means surrendering or openly giving up, but the kind of truces between local commanders and government forces that I saw so often when I was traveling you know, with the Mujahideen in, in, in the late 80s. Uh, or on the other hand, just conceivably, that at some stage there might be uh, a peace settlement possible with uh, the Taliban movement as a whole. Now, this, this brings me to, to Pakistan. I mean, uh, Pakistan has adopted a very hands-off approach to these elections as well, um, uh, partly because uh, it, you know, it, it saw no advantage to backing, you know, either to disrupting the process, let alone you know, no advantage whatsoever and many disadvantages to being seen to back um, one candidate. Anyway, none of the candidates were, um, were exactly favourites with Pakistan. Um, at the moment, um, the Pakistani uh, approach as far as Afghanistan is concerned appears to be largely one of wait and see. That does not mean, of course, that they're going to withdraw, uh, certainly they're not going to withdraw their shelter from the Afghan Taliban, and they will most probably continue uh, a degree of support for the Haqqani network, although there have been certain signs of exasperation with the Haqqanis, because the Haqqanis have not given them nearly as much help as they had hoped for when it comes to dealing with their own Taliban in North Waziristan. They haven't brought enough influence or pressure to bear. 
but the, the, the Pakistan is also, you know, adopting I think on the whole a wait and see policy. Um, you know, to wait and see what happens with these, you know, developments that I have described. You know, the um, the offensive next year, and so forth. And what this uh, and, and um, the Pakistani hope, I mean, what they would hope for, they would say, I mean, the military high command, the political establishment, uh, is eventually a peace settlement with the Taliban as a whole, in which the Taliban, there, there is power sharing in Kabul. Um, the Taliban, or should we say people reflecting, representing the Taliban, have a share of power, and that this brings an end to the war, but without, but certainly not, complete Taliban control, not Taliban victory. And I think what this reflects uh, is that there has been a shift in uh, Pakistani attitudes and policy in recent years. And these are not, by any means, exactly the same as they were in the 1990s. Uh, in other words, you know, in the 90s, Pakistan obviously backed the Taliban to win. They saw the Taliban as coming to power and becoming essentially a Pakistani client state, you know, expanding Pakistani influence, defending <coughs> Pakistani interests. Well, as we all know, that didn't turn out very well. It didn't turn out even you know, before 9-11, uh, above all because the Afghans, as Afghans so often do, towards their allies, you know, turned around and hit Pakistanis across the fence and told them to go to hell when the Pakistanis told them to do things that the Taliban didn't want to. Uh, but above all, um, of course, the, the shift in Pakistani attitudes, and it's not a, it's by no means a complete shift, it's only a partial shift, has been produced by the, uh, of course, tremendous rise uh, over the years since 2003 of Islamist rebellion within Pakistan itself. Um, you know, a, a, in effect, a, a civil war, or a series of small civil wars accompanied by very large-scale terrorism, uh, which has now claimed the lives of more than 6,000 Pakistani troops and paramilitaries, and several tens of thousands of Pakistani civilians. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the extent of the commitment uh, that the Pakistani military has had to make to deal with this insurgency was very much brought out uh, by this trip to South Waziristan, uh, where the Pakistani army has deployed three divisions of troops, South Waziristan alone. Uh, and several wings of the frontier corps, between 50 and 60,000 men. Uh, that's about a twelfth of Pakistan's entire armed forces, including the paramilitaries. Uh, it was the same, by the way, and, and this is a, an area of about 7,000 square kilometers, with a population even before the war started of only about 420,000 people. Now, barely half of those are there. So you have an extraordinarily high proportion of troops to population, which doesn't surprise me because. Um, uh, my uncle was a Gurkha officer fighting in South Waziristan against the Fakir Fak of Ippi's forces in the 1930s. And the British deployed two divisions uh, of the British Indian Army uh, in that campaign um, from what was, of course, in those days, a, you know, a, a really pretty small British Indian Army here. So, I mean, uh, the tribal areas do have a way of swallowing up very, very large numbers of troops. Um, and, uh, of course, South Waziristan is only one of the tribal agencies. So there has been a, you know, a huge commitment of troops there. And there are, of course, deep worries uh, concerning Karachi, that at some stage there might have to be military deployments there as well, given the, um, the ethnic and um, religious conflicts that bubble away uh, in, um, in Karachi. So, uh, how many minutes have we left? Yeah, I'll just say, say briefly. So to sum up um, the Pakistani position, in the past, uh, the Pakistani position in Afghanistan was balanced between fears, um, a fear that Afghanistan would become or was, if you look at you know, the policies of Dawood uh, and the communists, uh, a, a state hostile to Pakistan, and of course, the fear of India, which permeates you know, all Pakistani thinking as a whole, particularly in the in the army, uh, but of course this was balanced particularly uh, from the 90, from the 1980s on by ambition, this ambition to turn mm -hmm. Pakistan 
as a, sorry, Afghanistan as a whole into a, a Pakistani client state. The ambition has not gone by any means, but it's turned more into a negative thing, which is to say that now I think um, Pakistan's hopes and desires and plans uh, are uh, more to be absolutely candid, to keep you out or to try to keep you out, rather than fully you know, to get them in, if you see what I mean. Uh, and the fears, they are now balanced between two fears. One is the old fear of Afghanistan, of a hostile Afghanistan and India, uh, but this is now balanced against the real fear of the Afghan Taliban. And the fear that if the Afghan Taliban were to conquer the whole country, they would then be able to turn on Pakistan, that they could revive the Pashtunistan, the united Pashtunistan, Pashtunistan call, but in a much more menacing way, because under the banner of jihad and in alliance with the Pashtun Taliban within Pakistan. Uh, and uh, one should remember from this point of view that among uh, the many things that the Afghan Taliban did not do, even after coming to power in the 1990s with so much support from Pakistan, one of the things the Af Af Afghan Ta Taliban did not do uh, uh, was recognize the Grand Line, was recognize the Grand Line as an international frontier. Uh, for all the aid they got from Pakistan, as, you know, as proud Pashtun Afghan nationalists, the Afghan Taliban just would not do it, and they didn't, and they still haven't. Uh, and this, of course, you know, does create very uh, genuine fears within Pakistan. Uh, so, as I say, given all this, um, I think Pakistani policy at the moment uh, is in a holding mode, uh, in which, of course, as I say, they will continue uh, their, uh, most probably they will continue their limited support for the Haqqanis, um, uh, especially, I have to say, when it comes perhaps to attacking Indian targets in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, but um, they will at the same time, I think, discreetly, as they have done you know, to, to a considerable extent already, they will try to facilitate um, talks, negotiations, contacts uh, between the Afghan government and the Taliban. And they have been trying to improve their own or even create their own. Uh, contacts and relations uh, with uh, political forces in Kabul, including the people from the Northern Alliance. Because I think they have genuinely come to a conviction, as have these more pragmatic elements of the Taliban, that in the end, uh, however long they may be able to wage a guerrilla war in the Pashtun countryside, complete victory is out of the question. And that ultimately, uh, one will have to negotiate and ultimately live with other forces in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that, um, those insights, that, that um, fascinating analysis. I think clearly the uh, future ahead for Afghanistan is an uncertain one, um, and there are considerable challenges ahead, but I, you know, I take from what you said that there are some reasons to be optimistic, um, things we should feel confident about, other challenges which we need to uh, continue to address, and lots that we can discuss. Before we do that, though, let's hand over to Rudy, who's going to um, share some of his thoughts with us, and then uh, we'll take some questions from the audience. Great, Scott. Um, it's like to say, it's a real pleasure to be here, from Bonn, Calcutta. So it's a particular, it's particularly special for me to be here. I don't think they can hear me or... Yeah. You can't see me. There's a photograph on there. I'll try to see somebody All right. Um, okay. I don't think that's going to help. I don't think so. Okay. Thank you. That wasn't suitably daunting. This certainly is. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd just like to say um, thank you very much to Scott. The um, British Deputy High Commission, um, Aspen Ananta, as well as Calcutta University, where King's College London has been working for a few years now, especially with uh, Professor Surin Chand Das, Harish Vasudev, who is in the back of the room there, and others. It's a real thrill for both of us to be here. What I'll do is I'll keep my comments suitably pithy, allowing um, enough time for questions. I'll sort of divide the next 10 minutes into two parts. Um, what I thought I'd do is, and it's always a challenging task, Sort of trying to outline Indian positions on Afghanistan 
without acting as though you're parroting Indian official positions when it comes to Afghanistan. So what I'll do is I'll spend the first five minutes just talking about my own observations, work done in the field, both within Afghanistan and outside, as well as with uh, some of our uh, members in the, um, in the mission in Kabul, um, interviews with them, etc. And second, I thought what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing on reconciliation. This is clearly a complicated area. It's an area of much discussion and perhaps a certain degree of understanding, misunderstanding when it comes to you know, this um, fairly sort of tricky area of negotiations with the Taliban. Um, so to start with, um, I think it's an interesting period. Um, it's definitely a fragile period in the subcontinent and South Asia more generally. Two ported elections. Outcomes to both remain with a question mark, but perhaps I mean, it's easy to make certain predictions. Um, and at the same time, hovering over both these elections in a fairly potent way, but in very different contexts, is the question of withdrawal. And here, of course, I endorse what both Scott and Anatol said, is that we need to be careful when we use the word withdrawal rather than drawdown. Um, so what I'll do is, I'll just try and outline where I think India sits today in Afghanistan. So rather than talk about what might be considered the kind of established and known position with regards to, say, Indian investments, in Afghanistan, huge development footprint, no doubt about the fact that India is hugely popular um, in all parts of Afghanistan, including the Pashtun South, maybe not so much the Pashtun East, but certainly across the country from the north to the west, bordering Iran. Every single poll and survey conducted in Afghanistan since 2004 have categorically listed India as within the top two most popular countries or top three most popular countries within Afghanistan, and I think for good reason. There's a very strong development footprint. We build everything from solar toilets to the embassy, and perhaps much more importantly, highways such as 218 kilometer highways that have really sort of transformed to some extent um, the ability to transport goods from one part to another. I think what's interesting about the Indian investment is that a lot of the investment, at least in the early years, um, were A, done through Afghan line ministries. So I think quite unlike, say, World Bank funding or IMF funding, a lot of the funding through DFID and international institutions more broadly. Um, I think India has sort of auctioned out monies and funds to various Afghan line ministries to try as far as possible for that money to actually trickle down to projects which were realizable in Afghan eyes. So that meant building a women's self-help unit somewhere outside of Kabul. You had a women's self-help unit outside of Kabul which people could see. If it meant building a road, you had a road which you could physically see. I think when you have that kind of connection between um, sort of making certain commitments and following through on those commitments, and when people can actually use those commitments for your betterment of your local lives, um, I think it sort of changes the view that Afghans have across ethnicities about a particular sponsor state. So coming on to that, um, so I think there are a couple of points where India remains today. I'm quite happy to take questions about the last 10, 12 years. Uh, but I think it's a little more important to sort of look today and look forward. So the one thing I think in which India has done quite well, there's certainly no endorsement of Indian policy, but I think generally it's done quite well, is to maintain a degree of autonomy within Afghanistan. I was quite struck in 2010-11 when I was traveling in Kabul, and I went across and met with uh, some people who were sort of working in the embassy and who were in charge of these kind of economic programs. And you know, it's quite interesting because they live in houses right opposite the kind of ISAF, massive container like three-level security, this huge kind of infrastructure. And you know, if you go in with the British Army, which, which I had, I had sort of two convoys, and it was just me. Um, but I had sort of two convoys, four bodyguards, and um, so I called this, this contact I had at the embassy and said, look, I just live in a house opposite the so-called green zone, so just drop in any time you like. And it's very like casual attitude, and I told my sort of point person, and they went scuttering, they got a map, and they said, well, you know, the sense that you've got to wear a vest, etc., etc. And we turned up at this person's house, and you know, as as one would expect, it was a house. There was a little blue door, um, and you know, suddenly I knocked on the blue door. There was a chokidar who came up and said, "Ha sab aye," in the sense, and he said, "There's really no need for your vest, and you could certainly keep your gunman outside." <laughs> Went in and had a very frank conversation. I was interesting is the gentleman there. Been, I think what I found most striking, apart from all the details that he provided me, was I was sitting in the living room. Within sort of a period of three hours, in came the head of police in Kabul, very casually sat in. In came the agricultural minister from the Afghan line ministry, very casually sat in, had a cup of tea. 
And you realize that you know, perhaps India's approach is not well scripted, perhaps it's not um, well penned in terms of communication or doctrine, but it exists in, you know, I hate to say it, but in what John Elliott calls in his new book, this kind of chanta high attitude, right? It's, it just is there through local contacts, etc. Um, but the most striking part was that he, as an official working on economic policy, had never met with anybody from either, from inside the ISAF headquarters in the three years he was there. And that was a deliberate attempt on his part. This is not to say that they don't support and work with um, ISAF, American, and British commitments in different parts of Afghanistan. In fact, I think the, the MEA over here is quite open in, in, very open in and candid in saying that they're very thankful to British and American security cover for allowing India to make those sort of development commitments, which is of course very important and a key caveat to this autonomy that India has maintained. But looking forward, I think it is that autonomy in many ways um, that will provide India with a vast range of opportunities. It's a country that's comfortable with all three candidates in the ongoing elections. Um, certainly the two candidates that seem to be front runners, both Abdullah Abdullah and Ghani, um, doesn't have preferences. It has, you know, doesn't really have um, much indifference with either of the two landing, uh, sort of leading candidates. And I think that's not a natural outcome of the fact that Abdullah was foreign minister in a government in the 90s that India supported, or that his, his family perhaps is close to India. But I think there's work that's been done sort of under the wire to, in, to make sure that sort of India stays on the right side of future candidates. Um, however, looking forward, and I think here's one of the sort of big questions for the Indian establishment is, the kind of infrastructure and support that was provided specifically between 2004 and 2010, have we really heard this kind of established narrative of a development footprint, um, that would fast disappear. Is a lot of India's decision making seems to be much like Pakistan's, but obviously in a different context, um, designed around this kind of wait and see policy. So the key question seems to be for most Indian elites is not only the outcome of the election, but the future seems to be well sort of connected to the decisions made at the White House. And I think that is important, because India is very, very concerned about the kind of sort of troop commitment that the US White House will provide, um, even after the BSA is, is signed. I, there's any, um, I don't think there's any doubt in the minds of people in India who look at these issues that the BSA will be signed. The key question is how much of the infrastructure that was invested in the last 14 years will continue to sustain in Afghanistan or whether Afghanistan, in the words of Sherry Cooper Coles, will just become this kind of, kind of five garrison city country, leaving the rural south and east to the, the hands of this rather ambiguous term called the Taliban. And I think here there is a question in terms of wait and see policy are considered safe bets. It's safe to say that you have a wait and see policy, but it seems to me and a couple of other observers, students of us working on the ground, that unless India continues to sustain the the investment and the capital that it has made in the past eight years, the kind of goodwill that you see um, ticking on the polls and the surveys will very quickly turn around. This goodwill is not initiated because it's India. This goodwill is initiated because people actually drive on the roads that India helped to build. When you stop building those roads, when you stop funding the schools that you've been giving money to, and when you stop funding some small units like self-employment um, centers for women, or when you stop funding the thousand scholarships that we provide to Afghanistan for Afghan students to come study here, there's going to be a problem. Um, having said that, I'll sort of move on to another area of India. There's, there's a lot of discussion about India and Pakistan and potential proxy rivalry in Afghanistan. So the sort of established thesis, well popularized by William Dalibur, seems to be is that Afghanistan is going to end up being this kind of battleground between Indian and Pakistani interests and counter interests. Um, the kind of work that we've done so far, we've spent the last five, six, seven years working on a whole range of diplomatic initiatives, track two concerts, working with people in Pakistan, in the ISI, outside, in India, Afghanistan in itself, across groups in Afghanistan, is, seems to sort of, sort of, sort of pushes us um, towards a more kind of moderate conclusion, is that I don't see Afghanistan necessarily or automatically becoming a playground for Indian Pakistani interests and counter interests. That's an assumption. You know, intelligence agencies, that's what they do. Sometimes they make assumptions based on worst case scenarios. That's their job. But that, that's not necessarily the political prognosis of Afghanistan in the future. And here, here I do think and very strongly believe that there is a space for optimism. 
that this is not a land uh, sort of territory that necessarily has to return or necessarily has to represent the kind of uh, antagonism that is assumed between these two forces. I was quite struck in around 2005 and 2006, there was um, this is Pakistani line that India has 26 or 22 consulates based in different parts of India, uh, in Afghanistan, which is absolutely absurd. Um, and what's quite interesting is behind closed doors, in the sense it seems that there's, there's a Pakistani ambassador by the name of Riaz Koga, some of you here might have worked with him. And it's interesting where we met with Riaz and we were talking and stuff, and uh, you know, in the sense it was a time when Nirupama Rao had just sort of the first time, I think it was on the, I forget, on the sidelines of Timpo 2 perhaps, that she came out and said, you know, we're willing to talk to Pakistan about Afghanistan. And the Pakistanis went berserk on the headlines and said, well, how can we talk to India when you're supporting all sorts of anti-Pakistani activities out of Afghanistan? And uh, we had Riyaz Kokar exactly the same time in Kings, in London, discussing certain, you know, having a sort of doing a sort of track two event. And Riyaz sort of came out and said, well, you know, this is interesting because when I was in Afghanistan, I walked up to the Indian ambassador then in Kabul and said, look, why don't we just sort of put this to rest? Why don't we just discuss and see where your consulates are? And the Indian ambassador turned around and says, look, I'll give you 30 days notice. And it's in his book, if you get a chance, it's a great book called Afghanistan and Pakistan. I'll give you 30 days notice. Um, visit any consulate you want. Riyaz said, that sounds like a great idea. Let's dispel this narrative. Let's get on with the job of building Afghanistan. Sends this memo back to Islamabad. And of course, lo and behold, the next day sends a note to the Indian ambassador says, well, it's absolutely impossible that I should be able to visit any of your consonants. So I think there is a bit of understanding. There is sort of moves. And I think these are perhaps the kind of spaces that one will have to use for negotiating a moderately stable future. The prospects are dim. But I think there is some light between the crevice in order to try and multiply and monopolize these opportunities. I'll end, Scott, if I may, two minutes um, on a question of reconciliation on a completely different note. Is Anatol, myself, and a couple of others have spent the last six or seven years doing a fair bit of work with um, a very slim minority of what you might consider the political committee of the Afghan Taliban. We can be very technical with these names, but they matter analytically. It's a very small group, I'd say statistically, perhaps representing 5 to 10 percent of what, you, what was the old Quetta Shura, led by Mullah Muhammad Ahmad, whether he's alive or dead, of course, is another matter. And it was interesting, I think some of those conclusions, if I might just summarize, might be quite enlightening for this audience. And generally, I think for the, kind of, um, for the Indian reading of reconciliation, it's become quite, quite a bit different to even a year ago. So the three key foundings that we found, um, and these are sort of meeting with what you might consider um, Taliban interlocutors. There was a deputy minister of the 90s who is now retired from fighting. There was a minister in the Taliban government, a serving minister. And you know we spent an incredible amount of time to figure out that bond fights were actually correct. There was a team of six of us, a lot of time done in sort of figuring out that these guys, at least to a certain extent, represent um, the sort of ground forces based out of Quetta or Karachi. And there are three key sort of conclusions. So the Afghan government has set down rules for reconciliation, which Prime Minister Mohan Singh endorsed when he went to Kabul in the joint session of parliament, made very clear that India will endorse and follow an Afghan-led process towards negotiation. And the three key preconditions, as you know, was dropping links with Al-Qaeda, accepting the Afghan constitution, and laying down arms. And when we went into these interviews, we were quite convinced that these would be hugely combative areas. They would not agree to these preconditions, etc. But Lord Lord, what we found was this. A, which is interesting, the constitution is not a problem. As far as at least this moderate political element is considered, is concerned, the constitution of Afghanistan is not necessarily a problem. And that in a sense, it, it makes sense. The constitution of Afghanistan, if you flip through it, is based on Islamic jurisprudence. The key issue for the Taliban was one of trying to get away from this narrative of accepting a constitution which would be seen as surrendering to the Kabul government. So in a sense, what they suggested was more a kind of PR game to try and see if that element of the movement could have taken some sort of a religious debate over the constitution, so it's easier for them to accept it for their basic domestic audience. You know, sometimes we forget that even insurgents have a domestic audience. Second was the question of um, Al-Qaeda. Here again, we seem quite, um, they seem quite convinced that, and you know, I think this is basically confirmed also by other agencies in the West, that for this particular group, dissociating with what is formally or ambiguously called 
Al Qaeda wasn't really a problem. In fact, we even got some of them to sort of really sort of push them on questions of international terrorism. The one point, of course, being the only Indian um, on the table at the time negotiations that I found was just interesting is when you push them on the Lashkar Taiba, um, one of the deputy ministers said, "Well, there's a difference between foreign terrorists in Afghanistan and Lashkar Taiba. Lashkar Taiba, this is in the recording, is a nationalist movement." So of course there are questions about how they identify a variety of groups, but yet there is some amount of space in terms of the way they read the future. I'll end with sort of two points on looking at India, the question of reconciliation. It's absolutely clear that this war in Afghanistan, like many wars around the world, especially in our own country, cannot and will not end without some form of a peace agreement. And when I say that it will not end with a peace agreement, what I mean is you can have stability in Afghanistan, on accepted levels of stability, accepted levels of loss of lives year by year out. But you will not find long-lasting stability in terms of potential peace, potentials for economic growth, potentials for autonomy within Afghanistan, potential for non-interference, unless there is some amount of agreement between a large faction of people who do fight with arms against the Afghan state, against a variety of Western forces within Afghanistan. So that's just the bitter reality um, of conflict in itself. Um, and I think on that score, our own reading is that in India there's, there's, there's been this um, very strong and vehement uh, sort of opposition to the idea of reconciliation. Um, but I think what's interesting is there are many, at least in my own personal observations, who over the, many, many, sort of over the last three or four years have come around to this conclusion. And the question I ask is how could we not come, across, come out to this conclusion? We are a country that has seen insurgency since 1945. Some of these insurgencies have taken 30 to 40 years to come to resolution. There are some insurgencies that took 30 years, which then ended with an insurgent leader actually becoming the chief minister of the state. So isn't it somewhat paradoxical that we suggest that we can't accept any form of reconciliation? There are, of course, clear lines of what that reconciliation means. There are clear lines of what Indian, where Indian interests lie. But I, and I just end with this, I think, or perhaps a less um, sort of less recognized figure in the Indian media last year was actually quite important, was when you really saw a change in the establishment's view towards reconciliation, um, is when Mullah Muhammad Zaif, uh, um, Salam Zaif, who is a former Taliban ambassador to Pakistan, someone who spent his time in Guantanamo and now lives freely in Kabul, um, was in fact invited and hung out in Goa. Now the only reason as to why the media, I can only assume, um, did not pick up on that because they had other things to pick up in Goa, which made the headlines. Is that hope, perhaps? Thank you. future of Afghanistan, and in fact, arguably has a strategic imperative to do just that. So lots to talk about. Well, I'm going to stop yes. talking because I want to get questions from the audience. For a bit of rest of time, but I think let's um, let's see where we get to. Um, questions, please, for either of our two speakers. So. Yeah, please, Eugene, keep your hand. I commanded Kashmir and Ladakh during the period of um, 99 onwards. <laughs> so I watched Operation Enduring Freedom very closely and intimately, dealt extensively with the Russia and the other groups. Uh, you would forgive me disagreeing with you, Professor, on a number of issues. Uh, and that will open it up further for discussion. First thing is, who is the Taliban? The Taliban is 30% the Pak Army, who signed retirement certificates, but are earning salaries on deputation. In the Taliban, who are the Americans fighting? The Pak Army. In the Taliban, Taliban. Who mans the Taliban's tanks, their artillery, and everything else that is required? The Pakistani Army. Who supported the Taliban during the entire period of the Americans going in? The Pakistani army. The Americans realized this and gave Musharraf an opportunity to pull up the Pakistani army and had a pause in operations so the Pakistani could Pakistanis could evacuate. No less than something between 10 to 20,000 Pakistanis were evacuated from the field. We didn't understand why the Americans did it, because they're back again to fight them. The people who were also taken out were the leaders of the Taliban. 
Even today, the Taliban is controlled by the ISI. Tomorrow, once the drawback, uh, drawdown takes place, you're going to fight the Pakistani army, the Americans who are left behind, or whatever other forces. And that's something you have to contend with. I totally agree that 2015 uh, will dictate terms and there won't be a Taliban offensive. But it will actually be a Pakistani offensive to regain what they call strategic depth. And they will not give up on that issue of strategy. The other issue in relation to Taliban is uh, attitudes of Pakistan change when the Americans pressurize them. Now that that pressure is lifted, attitudes would revert. You've got the same officers with the same upbringing leading the Taliban. <clears throat> Along with that, uh, the last issue is, in the earlier stage when the Taliban went on offensive, majority were not battles, they bought over the operatives with funds from the Chinese, funds from Iran, and Pakistani funds. That's going to happen again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Obviously, so the, the Taliban don't have any tanks and artillery for the Pakistanis to man. They, they just don't. Secondly, I know of no evidence that the Chinese ever funded the Taliban. I mean, that just isn't there. Um, thirdly, among the Taliban dead and prisoners, you know, who have been identified, you know, by our forces uh, in Afghanistan, uh, the the great majority are local Afghan Pashtuns from you know, the areas where the Taliban is fighting. Uh, undoubtedly, of course, with also volunteers uh, from the Afghan, uh, sorry, from the Pakistani Pashtun territories, the tribal areas, but then, so that has always been true, and in both directions. Uh, you talked about the Pakistanis who fought in, uh, with, with the Taliban in 2001, but you know, the, the, the single most prominent group uh, where the TNSM from SWAT, uh, led by uh, Mullah Fazlullah, and Sheikh Mohammed, well, of course, they went back, they were evacuated by the Pakistanis back to Pakistan, and what did they subsequently do? They revolted against Pakistan in Swat, uh, in the name of their Islamist agenda, uh, and it took a massive military operation, eventually, to drive them out again, and uh, by all accounts, including those of Western intelligence, at least, Fazl So I think, look, you heard me say that Pakistan is indeed supporting, I mean, only to a limited degree, but supporting the Haqqani network and sheltering the Afghan Taliban, that is entirely true. Uh, but the thing is that what one also sees and has seen, uh, you know, go, going all the way back um, to the 1840s, uh, is that the border between you know, whatever territory has now become Pakistan, in those days, of course, it was the British Indian Empire, and the, the kingdom of, of Afghanistan is a porous one, because what we are facing is a highly complicated, complex. The uh, Mullah Omar and some of the others have, on occasions, publicly called on the Pakistani Taliban to cease their attack on the Pakistani state, because you know, this is essentially you know, un undermining the Muslim cause, and that they should concentrate on fighting you know, the, the um, Americans and their allies in Afghanistan. Uh, it is worth saying, though, that as I think our conversations also brought out very strongly, um, and Rudy, I think, would back me up on this, that the, the great majority of the Afghan Taliban really loathe Pakistan, and the ISI in particular, and do not like, do not want to be you know, under Pakistan's thumb. And if, if may I a brief anecdote? Which I think will, will is a, encapsulate some of this. When I was coming out of Afghanistan, um, having travelled with the Mujahideen in 1988, I think it was, it could have been 89, anyway. Um, and a little bit as, as they are now, to be honest, the Pakistanis were playing this game whereby everybody knew I mean, then, of course, it wasn't just shelter, it was really strong support um, with us uh, for the Mujahideen. But because they didn't want the media actually to see them handing over the guns, they tried to 
well, make it so that Western journalists going into Afghanistan had to sort of, you know, hide themselves and disguise themselves. And so, you know, you had a certain amount of trouble. You were picked up. You were stopped. And I was uh, stopped uh, with my, my Afghan driver and hauled in. Um, and there was this uh, ISI officer there who, I mean, it's, he clearly something at breakfast had disagreed with him or he'd argued with his superior officer or something. And he was sort of curt but polite to me. But the first thing he did to my Afghan Mujahideen driver, uh, without, without asking him a question, without saying anything, he hit him across the face twice. Bah, bah. Just because you know, he was an Afghan, this is the way you let off steam. That's not the way to make yourself loved, and they aren't loved. Very uh, quick answer on uh, sort of regional compact or sort of how the region perhaps sees Afghanistan is I think very unfortunately what we don't have is any form or any potential at the moment for a regional compact. There is a lot of discussion about should the region, should the sort of countries of the region come together to make joint commitments of when it comes to infrastructure, economic assistance, development assistance, etc. But unfortunately, I think for a whole variety of reasons. Um, those pushing that line of argument will inevitably find themselves um, or sort of find themselves not to a sort of road towards an answer, but rather towards a wall. I think that the, in terms of the region, what we see is the, the greater potential lies in bilateral relations in each country actually putting in what they can in Afghanistan. And there is some amount of hope in terms of what, what sort of the neighbors sort of see. Um, I think India's trying at some level to rethink or think about its own economic footprint. Um, I think it's quite encouraging, a couple of years ago when um, the foreign minister went, went across to Beijing and actually volunteered for India to be put on the Shanghai Cooperative, sort of the SEO. I think that's a platform that could be used cooperatively. It certainly provides India with observer status to sort of at least figure out what it is that the Chinese are thinking when it comes to Afghanistan beyond copper mines. Um, and second, I think in terms of the, the, the key country in Afghanistan, of course, be, you know, beyond almost any other, is Iran. I mean, unless Iran takes a cooperative stance when it comes to Afghanistan, I mean, de facto, it has influence over a good part of Western Afghanistan, everything from Nimruz, Farah, Hirat, and otherwise. And there's thing for India, to, you know, in terms of, it uh, positions themselves quite well, where Indian-Iranian cooperation, where they'd be building a port in Chabahar, and hence linking it India, if a potential railroad comes together, all the way into Afghanistan to Pamir. Now, apart from strategic or Machiavellian schemes, on the part of Tehran and New Delhi, I think what it will do is essentially increase and allow for the expansion of infrastructure, transport, etc., within Afghanistan. Um, so, is there a regional compact? Is there potential? My own view at the moment, no. Is there potential for countries to get together a bilateral compact? So, whether it be India and Russia to a certain extent, India and Iran in a different context. Um, and the country I leave out here is Pakistan, because the key question is, I just don't know to the extent to which Pakistan will work with any of the regional countries towards a regional compact. And the one thing that is quite clear is that Pakistan has consistently refused um, officially to discuss India with, uh, discuss Afghanistan with India. There have been overtures over the last five years, and I think the most clear overture was made um, at a very difficult time by the Foreign Secretary Nirupa Rao after the Indian Embassy was almost taken out from the outside in Kabul. And I think it was, it was quite interesting that it was only a few months after that India still made this over to say, look, let's talk about uh, joint economic programs, etc. But I think for a variety of reasons, it's difficult for Pakistan to get onto the cooperative bank bagging on this scheme. And for a very brief addition. Yeah. I should just say that, that when it comes to regional cooperation, something that the Pakistani government certainly is interested in is this Khaza 1000 idea of a major electricity line from Central Asia to Pakistan through Afghanistan. This requires, of course, cooperation with Russia, among other countries, but it also, of course, by definition, requires uh, you know, minimum, it, well, it requires cooperation with the Afghan state and government and minimum stability in Afghanistan. So, as, as you see, I mean, now the electricity is not the principal interest of the Pakistan military, uh, but um, the Pakistan <coughs> state and government actually are interested in, in <coughs> developing such a, such a state in, in Right, we have horribly overrun, but there are still lots of hands in the end. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to take a few more questions. The questions need to be under 10 seconds and the answers need to be under 30. <laughs>
prosperity and Afghanistan you know, being able to pay for its own budget. But I'm afraid it, it, you know, it, it will take, at best, a considerable number of years. Remember, I mean, of course India has a perfect right to, to create consulates wherever, you know, wherever it wants to and wherever the host state agrees. Let's stop it in the first instance. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, coming to the drawdown, it's actually the collateral damage of the drawdown uh, that's worrisome. Apparently, the CIA has engaged the counter-terrorism in Kunar, and there's a huge big uh, movement there, and there's the Kosh uh, Protection Force, both of, both of which will be severely impacted when there is a drawdown, because the kind of support or protection that the CIA receives will, will itself get, uh, get reduced. Consequently, the CIA itself will not be able to function, and these, uh, these engagements will then get severely impacted. Um, clearly. Uh, when I said that, you know, and I suppose it was only a drawdown, I mean, uh, what I was saying was, of course, that the, the, the US will remain engaged, you know, and it will remain engaged in supporting the Afghan state. But obviously, it will have fewer military resources with which to do so and to support US intelligence operations, certainly. Yes, yes. The that's been provided to the Kandahar Air Force Base, etc., will continue. I mean, the much bigger question about drawdown is the various different projects that have been launched in the whole of Afghanistan in 30 odd provinces, which will not have a security blanket. So, you know, conspiracy theories aside, I'll just say, as far as I'm concerned, CIA is really the last thing that we need to worry about when it comes to Afghanistan. Okay, last question. Uh, time is really up. I'm uh, from Jadapur University, Purushottam Bhattacharya. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, Professor Levin, of course, has been very clear, but I will, I'm still interested in knowing uh, uh, what kind of crystal ball gazing can you do uh, when you compare uh, Afghanistan uh, post-2014 post Iraq, uh, what has happened in Iraq, I think. I mean, you, you suddenly painted a more optimistic picture about uh, what will happen in Afghanistan, I mean, as uh, opposed to what is happening in Iraq at the moment after the withdrawal of the Americans. And one quick question to Rudro. Uh, you said that, uh, of course, you know, the Indian development uh, programs actually have uh, been very successful, primarily because of the fact that uh, they have received uh, American air cover. Now, that will disappear after 2014. So, what prospects do you see of Indian programs actually running smoothly uh, from 2015 onwards? Thank you. Um, I think that's a big question in terms of, I think there are many people in India and certainly many, many contract contractors, agencies, companies working for India or because of India within Afghanistan that are worried about this. And it's quite clear with a variety of provinces, both in the south and the east, I think there has been a push to kind of um, extend the development fund away from the traditional Indian friendly areas in the north to the sort of more tricky areas in the south and the east. But the hope will be is that Indian, that um, America will make and Britain will make less importantly um, on this score perhaps, if I may say Scott, um, over the sort of next... Well, I suppose the hope compared to Afghanistan, and I should say, as a compared to Iraq, and I should say it's, it's only a hope. I'm very, very conscious uh, of, you know, the, the, the possibilities of disaster. But the hope would perhaps be uh, Iraq, and that the, the vast majority, I mean, the have of the 90s, uh, but despite all that, the absolutely overwhelming sum deal whereby they share power. Uh, I fear that that may, may take a very long time, but that, as Rudy has indeed said, uh, ultimately there would have to be some kind of settlement. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you, uh, for all of those insights. We could have kept this conversation going, leave the room without extracting a few more insights from you. Um, so, uh, so I'm sure people will come and ask you a few more questions before you go. Um, on behalf of the uh, British Deputy High Commission, we just say it's been a great pleasure for us to host this event. My colleague's going to say a few words by way of conclusion. But I, um, I'm encouraged by the, by the response from a number of people who have come to join us in this conversation this evening. It does make me wonder if maybe we could look at ways of doing more of this sort of thing in the future on other topics. I see lots of people nodding here. Um, this is a great place to have these sorts of conversations. As I said at the outset, this city is, um, is a 
is an intellectual powerhouse. It's a place where great debates are supposed to happen and do happen whether you like it or not. Uh, so perhaps we can find some ways to facilitate some more conversations over the coming months. And I look forward to seeing some more of you for those. But let me hand over to Sahani uh, Aurora, who actually worked with her and to put all of this together. Hello? Yes. Okay. Um, I just want to thank you all so much for coming and making the time to be here. We've been absolutely overwhelmed with the response and uh, it makes us feel very proud of being Calcutton. And uh, on behalf of the British Deputy High Commission, as well as the Anand Aspen Centre, thanks for coming and we hope you that we owe special thanks to UK Erie and the University of Calcutta. And also thank you Scott for your excellent moderation and could we please have a, a round of applause for us.